Hey students, this is a really, really important video. Probably one of the most, because your rendering skills are everything, no matter what direction you go in art, whether it's commercial or whether you're just doing this for fun or whether you're an art major, it doesn't matter. You, you've got to know how to draw. And it's not enough to take one drawing class. Usually, you take several. You can take our art classes multiple times. There's three levels of drawing intermediate studio. Um, actually, there's four. Uh, beginning, intermediate studio, and studio drawing, plus beginning, intermediate studio, and studio figure drawing, which by the end you should have a really good portfolio. We also offer um, all kinds of painting classes and illustration classes and even digital that require strong drawing skills. Um, and a lot of times, especially with the online situation, we use grids because grids are a way for you to get accuracy right off the bat and it's a good way to build a composition without um, having direct supervision with somebody sitting in your chair and looking at your eye level. Um, so in this setting, we are going to be drawing from imagery that either you shot yourself and used the image as a guide or you um, used an image from the list that I provide that you might need to use. Anyway, regardless um, of what subject it is or what color scheme it is or anything like that, you want to be familiar with gesture drawing. And gesture drawing is also used in combination with a simple grid. Um, the grid really in real life drawing is just a series of extended lines that are helpful for finding out where things fall, which is why in a drawing class you always use a viewfinder and you hold it up to the subject and it helps you see, first of all, what section of a still life you're going to render, because usually it's not zoomed in as I have mine on here, but usually it's a huge still life and you zoom in on a section that's interesting. So that's one way to use the viewfinder, but we also use it to measure distances. You know, like that lemon is half of that, we know because of this. Uh, the lemon here is, or whatever it is, pear, it's a pear, is this tall, whereas the orange thing is tiny. So looking through a viewfinder is not just about picking a composition or using it to make a grid or a trail along a grid, but it's also for um, measuring within that little square. So that's what we call extended lines. Um, extended line would be across something to figure out where things hit so that you can determine what's higher and lower. See how the pear is lower than the brown vase? You wouldn't know that without taking a look at, an, at a line across. And then look at this, you put a vertical line and that shows you that the orange is to the right of the pear. And that this is to the right of that. So you're comparing one thing to another and we call those extended lines. You can start a drawing by making a grid so that your extended lines are built in or you can double check everything later with a T-square or using your marked up viewfinder. But that's the difference between an extended line and a grid even though they're both composed of horizontal and vertical lines like a viewfinder is. Um, first things first you want, regardless of whether you're using a grid or gesture, and this is going to be a gesture drawing demo, if you're doing gesture, you still need to have your paper to scale. So if you're looking at an image like this, you need to make sure that the size of the rectangle is to scale with this rectangle. So the easiest way is if you happen to have 15 by 20 paper or 16 by 20 paper, you just double an 8 by 10. Print it, double it. Sometimes though you print it and it's a square or it's a long rectangle or the border's thicker on the sides, then you have to take a look. You don't want it to be bigger than the paper that you have and you don't want it to be small. I have this only so it fits in here, you can see. If I were to measure this, it's seven. It's not eight this way. If I measure it this way, it's ten and a half, not ten. So you have to write it down. It's a math thing. If you have a seven and a half by 10 image, how is your surface gonna match that scale? You're not gonna copy it. You're not gonna copy the size. I'm doing it small only because, in fact, I made it bigger. 
here. I had to take paper together to do it. But um, if I doubled this, I would end up with 14 by 21. I don't have paper that big. Now you could, because of your, or 10 and a half it would be, yeah, it would be 21 by 14. So you could make a border and do it on there. I didn't have that. So instead, and this is something you can do, is shrink it down. Shrink it down on the Xerox and then find a scale that works. I shrunk this down to four by six on my Xerox machine, or I could print it that way. Now I know that my paper needs to be in scale to that. So I made it 12 by eight. And that's why I had to tape it together. So really I'm looking at this. So if this is your image, this is your image. I just wanted you to see what I meant by when you print it out, how it doesn't come out exactly 8 by 10, then you have to adjust it to fit. Now this is going to be more your proportion. I'm doing this so you can see, but pretend that's your 8 by whatever it is, and this is your 16 by 20. So that's the scale. You just want to be sure that the shape matches the shape. If you try to draw a rectangle within a square, it's a disaster. So that's step one, is to make sure that using a ruler, that whatever you print out is to scale with your paper. You can triple it, double it, as long as it fits on your paper, and try to use the whole paper, not make it tiny, tiny. So that's the first thing. Next thing I wanted to show you is, when you print something from the internet, my printer did a pretty good job with this. This is a project I'm going to use for what's called local color in um, my intermediate class, and it's also going to be what you guys use for um, in beginning watercolor is the Earth Tone project, because both of those projects are all about matching the exact hue. Now, when you do local color, you're dealing with hue, value, intensity, and temperature. It's a very complex project. It's the hardest one in the whole class. It's called Earth Tones and Accents, and the local color for my uh, intermediate and studio students, also the most difficult. Same project. Same project. Different imagery. Um, so, I wanted to make sure that I bring this in. This, this is a gesture drawing demo. It's also an introduction to every still life that you're going to do in both classes. And it's an introduction to all kinds of just a drawing no matter what it is. Um, and I want to show you what I see. And this is what I see and this is where gesture comes in. Most people, this is just human nature. They see an apple or a pear and they draw it, literally they draw it like this. Or they go like, oh this is, this is classic, apple with a leaf. That's a cartoon. That has nothing to do with real life. It's somebody's idea of what something is shaped like. It's also the biggest mistake in people thinking that organic shapes are round. And you have to kind of train your brain not to see things as round. I know it sounds weird, but even a tennis ball is not round. It's a square, it's a structure. And the actual curvature at the end is planar. You can see it right here in this pair. This pair is not, I mean, I would not draw this pair like this, no matter what I think it is. And you might get close, but you still have this cartoony thing. Like, like when people draw lips like that, they go like this, like, you know, like some cartoon lady lips. That is not a formal drawing. So we want to view every single thing as organic but based in geometry. Because um, this is round, this is round, this is round. The drapery's round, but really in real life, it's a square, all of it. So if you can get your head wrapped around that and see how we develop gesture, you're gonna have much more confidence when you get to any kind of complex drawing. This includes portraiture, this includes all kinds of things. People tend to draw skin and not bones. People only see skin when underneath we have a tremendous amount of activity with bone and muscle and fibers and same is true of still life. So anyway, I don't want to ramble, but there's so much to talk about that I'll try to do this in stages. But when I see this, 
what do you see? I see angles, I see geometry, I see heights, I see ellipses, I see symmetry, I see all of these planar flat surfaces up and down, around, ellipses in here. There's a lot linear perspective in the board. When you look at a simple thing, the average person will say, oh look, there's a pear and a plate with a knife and a towel and a piece of orange, you know, on a piece of wood. That's how most people see life. But really what this is is extraordinary structure, textural relationships, angles, volume, value, very complex color, highlights, cast shadows. It's a very complex, very complex subject. So this won't be easy, but I want you to get a sense of what I see. If you look at this and you start to see this, then you're on the right track. Because what's here is the angle of the towel, the angle of the linear perspective that will converge as two point always does, the angle of the orange, how things go through. Because when you look at a object that's on its side, it's going this way. Everything people think is round is actually square. So if you look at this, this is a square. And if you draw everything as a square first, you'll get more accurate because now it's symmetrical and then you can create the subtle shifts later. This is a square and a triangle. Mostly squares though. Squares, rectangles. This is another trapezoid. I say squares rectangles meaning all geometric shapes. Don't worry about the round. People always draw the round and the curve and the swerve and it's it's so surface. So you want to look through the surface. Instead of this looking like a shiny ceramic things, we look for where's the center axis? Where's the gravity? Where's the eye level? And as you know from beginning drawing, as you're looking down here at the top of an ellipse, whoever took this picture, and if you take your own and you're standing above it, that's what you're gonna see. So you have a, an ellipse that, you mean your eye level's up here, the ellipse will get gradually, gradually wider, and every single ellipse will rotate around that center axis. I also wanna look for the angles of the table and how they start to converge out in space. This one meets this one meets this one. Then I want to look at the angle of that knife. I want to look at the center of the ellipse here and here. And the general structure, especially, for example, the angle of these handles. People will draw these like as if they're rounded little, they draw them like they're little rounded things that are even like ears. And it's actually not. So you can see it on here. People would draw it like that, but really it's a tilt. It's an angle going down. So if we were in a drawing class and I sat in your chair and you were looking at this and your eye level were above this, I would make these corrections. So these are the things you want to analyze. I know it looks crazy and messy, but you want to analyze the angles, the structure, the placement, the verticality, the symmetry, all of these things before you even begin. So we're going to draw this without, without a grid. I'm going to take it away now because I'm keeping this in mind and you can always take a look at that on a s separate paper and figure it out first. But this is how we draw. If you take away the subject and only look at these marks that I made in lines, then you're drawing. You're drawing the design and the composition, not the things. But if I draw from here, you won't see what I'm trying to say because I want you to think this way while you're looking at that. And of course it doesn't matter if this is black and white or anything like that. We're going to use value to draw but not value as a filling anything in. So I like to use regular pencil first. This is scratch paper because with watercolor you always have to transfer it at the very end. And I'm going to now ballpark what I just showed you over there. And I'm not looking at a real object, so I have to really take a look at 
what I'm doing, make sure this doesn't blow away. Okay, regular pencil, and then I'm going to switch later into colored pencil because that's a great way to render. It's a really great way to render. Okay, first of all, even though we're not doing a grid, you want to loosely, loosely hold this and get a sense of where the middle is. This is not with a T-square. You're not measuring. See how I'm moving my body like almost like a rocking chair? Forward and back, forward and back, very lightly holding the pencil so that I get a sense of the center. Doesn't have to be exact, but it's a visual placement. Now I'm gonna to try to find what I see in here somewhere is gonna be center. And I can compare these four quadrants just to kind of get a sense. And then I wanna see right around here is where it falls and right around here is where it falls. So that allows me to get a sense of where I'm gonna be starting to block things out. I want to block everything out as if it's a geometric shape. So I'm going to start by figuring out where the top of this might be and simply do a flat line. And we call it extended lines because I do it wider than what it is. If you elongate a line, it gives you options for comparing within the composition. If you stop short, you have no way of comparing this to heights of other things. So that's why we call it an extended line. Now I want to find the center of where this hits. It's going to be right about here, and I'm going to find the center axis of this structure. Also, if you have an image or you take a picture and there's like a weak box and it tilts, don't draw it that way. It looks weird. It looks like you made a mistake. Same thing with uh, if you take a picture of a building and the sides start to converge a little, draw them vertically with a T-square. It just promised me, unless you reshoot it, this looks weird if it's tilted. See how this is tilted? You don't want to draw it like that. This is fine, but this tilted, any ellipse, is weird. Even though this, this is on an angle in terms of the turning of the handles, because it's foreshortened, as would be a human standing sideways, the ellipse is not flush and we want to draw as if it is. It'll just make the picture look better. Same with the plate. It's tilting weird, yet I chose this picture because I really dig um, all the variety of shapes, sizes. It's a good design, which every still life should be. So a big part of a good still life is setting it up properly, which is why we go step by step through that. Okay. So now I want to figure out where in here the bottom of this thing falls and I want to do a loose ellipse. Very loose, loose, loose ellipse. All I'm doing right now is placing placing my relationships very lightly. I'll move this over a little. See how I'm drawing all the way through? So that gives me options. And I moved, see I already moved my center line over and that makes it more effective to have options for moving around. And see how my marks are really messy but light and repetitive? That's gesture. All right, now over here I have another ellipse that I wanna capture in here just to get me oriented. Let's see what I got like in here somewhere. Because it gets wider and then you can see it starts to get narrower. That's where the slinky comes in. I always draw ellipses on the inside of things as a slinky. And what's cool is on here it actually shows you elliptical shiny marks, which is the whoever designed this does that. Now this is a this is a perfect example of an organic object that is not round. It's not. I promise you, when you draw a bottle or anything, take a hard edge drag it over to where you are sitting or in the air or wherever you are and draw a flat edge like that. You can even go like this and get the sense of the angle of the base of that thing. 
and it's a straight edge. Notice I didn't define the corner. Now I'm going to do a vertical so that I know where this hits on the composition. You can see how it's left of center. So I'm going to do a vertical here. But you can see I'm not curving anything. Then I can do this one. It's about like that. It runs right into the ellipse. So that's what round objects are. They're squares, they're angles, they're flat lines. There, there, there. And that's what I want to do to create this idea of geometry. Now since I have identified the center of this, I can create symmetry just by measuring. You don't need a ruler to create symmetry. It's a visual symmetry. And these ellipses will be helpful because every ellipse it has a center flat line in the middle. And they're almost symmetrical around it. The base is always a little bit wider. But they line right up to the sides of the paper. So this is where a T-square, if you drag a T-square along here, you'll be able to check all your verticals. And that's also why people often start with a grid because you can double check, not with a yardstick, but with a T-square, or if you don't have a T-square, you can use the corner of something. And you can do a series of lines that go up that are perfectly horizontal. You just have to make sure they are. And that, whoops, that gives you kind of a glimpse at what a grid would be if you were to draw one. And you can do the same thing in any area where you might want a reference so that something doesn't fall over. And it's not any specific grid. It's not any specific grid. It's just for you to have a visual so that things aren't leaning. I'm going to try to keep this under 30 minutes. Um, okay. Now I want to create some symmetry here with these lines that are vertical and some symmetry here. Now, something I want to really look at now is the angle of these handles. These handles go down. See how they go down? So I want to make sure that I'm drawing this down. Just trying to get my center point again top. It's going to go over to like here. This is where my ellipse is going to converge around here. And then I have some verticality and then I have my flat line. And then within here I can see where the handles fall. They fall about here. You just use a vertical and about here. One's in front, one's behind. Eventually, I will put that behind, but it's irrelevant right now. So now I can go like this. So the diagonals are just as important as the placement. I can always come back later and check these diagonals. I mean, check these shapes and where they are in relation to each other. But if I don't have my angles, things get really off. It's going to be flat here at the base of the ellipse. And now I'm going to start seeing where things hit on here. This hits about halfway down. So I'm going to do that. And I'm going to be really conscious to draw all the way through the table. There's going to be all kinds of ways to double check these with the negative space later. I have my ellipses steeper here. It's wider there. Handles on an angle there. Diagonal through here. This diagonal comes about here. And this diagonal comes about here. I want to make sure I have those correct. And that they're going to all go to a vanishing point. I want to draw them all the way through, because by drawing them through, you can see if you are correct. So when I get down to this knife and this point, I'll be able to make sure that it goes through all the way properly. 
But linear perspective in boxes, it's actually easier to draw your objects and then use the objects to draw that. Just wanted to get a general composition. Now instead of drawing this as a circle, even though I know it is, I'm going to draw it as a square. And I'm going to figure out the way things move through it. It goes up and down. Later, I'm going to come back in and figure out the triangles that are under there in the surface. Flatnesses, it's very flat on the bottom, flat on the edge, flat on the side. So now my square is turning into more of an octagon. And I'm able to study the structure of it instead of the roundedness of it. Like even this, it's not ready for that yet. It also has an ellipse. It doesn't mean that it's a, I'm drawing it as a round object any more than I did this one. But it gives me this sense of elliptical movement because now I know it moves through there. Same with this one. I'm going to do it as a square. Find all those geometric shapes in there. studying it and figuring out the posture of it and how it sits. Now I found that. Now I'm going to see where the ellipse falls. Now I'm going to see the angle of the knife. All of this is called organizational drawing. I'm observing what's going to be hard and what I need to work on in terms of placement that's in front of that. So I've got this ellipse, I've got these ellipses, I've got an ellipse on here, I'm getting to see the direction of it, I'm seeing this as an octagon, I'm seeing this as a surface of geometric shapes, I'm not seeing the curve, I'm only seeing the edge, I'm only seeing the flat lines within the ellipses, and right now the only thing organic on here are my elliptical movements. The plate, the bottle, the uh, fruit, that's it. I haven't even started with the drapery, which is another series of geometric shapes. But you see how messy, how messy this is. You see how I'm going to make all kinds of corrections to this as I go. I'm visualizing how things are placed together. If you, if something is happening too fast and you haven't taken the time to move things around and make mistakes and study it, you're going to get into trouble. And what happens is people get frustrated. They commit to something and then they want to decorate. They want to decorate, put in the values and the textures and all this cool stuff. And it might look cool, but it's not accurate. So now I'm studying the distance between here. And I'm going to use this as an anchor for the entire composition. If I can build this, then everything comes out of that, like a radial balance system. This is what I'm now learning. It's very uh, step intuitive. I'm not, I would never have known this when I sat down to start showing you this, this structural. This is all called organizational drawing. And I would never have known, sitting down here, what my mistakes are going to be, what my problems are, what is going to be the challenge. The whole thing is very challenging. I can't possibly know something until I'm working with it. So I'm not happy, of course, but I know that this is structural. And see how I'm doing a bunch of flat lines. And I'm gradually getting darker, and I'm gradually starting to get a sense of the sizes. This is smaller. I'm going to make a smaller square. This is a little out more, but it comes in more, so I'm going to go like this. So I'm slowly building up. This is fine. These are vertical. And you see I'm starting to get darker and I'm starting to get looser, and this is really just a stage. A lot of people would start a fresh sheet at this point. I'm one to just keep building and start adding color. 
At this point, I would start considering my negative space as a tool. It's 30 minutes. I got to I don't want to keep you, but I can start to see where negative space hits on things and start to fill it a little bit. This will help me measure. This will help me see if I'm anywhere near where I want to be. But th the main thing to get out of this video is see how I don't use anything curved. Aside from ellipses, there's no curvy, heart-shaped, lip-shaped, pear-shaped, weirdo, apple-shaped. We are doing this kind of mark. Every circle is a series of marks. For example, a circle is, what is a circle? Not that. You know what a circle is? It's a square with lines going around and around and around and around until you understand the width, the structure. It will have something like this in the front if it's, if it's geometric. I mean, it is geometric, but if it's round like a sphere, it'll start having these kind of structural levels on the front that go out almost like a hallway, and that's gonna give you the beginnings of the roundedness. So when you, if you do enough lines like this, guess what you end up with? Something round. And that is the correct gestural approach as opposed to the average person goes like this. This weird mechanical line circle that doesn't reflect reality. Like if they do lips like this, when really lips are structural, three-dimensional cubes. And they have all kinds of complexity, structural planal shapes. They have all of these elements that come around, that come up and around and up. And then you start to use things like corners, a line across the middle, structure in the middle, and then, of course, you do the structure of each, the bottom lip, the top lip, and then we never define the base, it's just skin. And then the top of the mouth is defined by this shape, the filtrop under the nose, which is also geometric. All the bones are geometric. So you always wanna avoid that. Focus on this, take your time with this. This is barely scratching the surface of where this needs to go.